Ah, Pokemon cards. Remember in the early 2000s, everyone collected them and every school seemed to ban them, but how many people actually knew how to play the game? From my experience, people just looked at the numbers and assumed that the Pokemon cards with the bigger numbers were therefore better, and in some cases they were right, but bigger doesn't always mean better. Speaking of which, there was a shop that I specifically remember selling individual Pokemon cards, and that included a Charizard that was selling for a hundred pounds. A hundred pounds! It should be noted that a pack of eleven cards cost just a few pounds in comparison, so if you really wanted that Charizard card, you really had to save up your pocket money. And you still had to save up your pocket money anyway, because buying cards wasn't cheap. If you really wanted to form your own deck, you know, one that could actually win, it wasn't cheap. Well, thankfully, there was the Pokemon trading card game for the Game Boy Color, where you can satisfy your Pokemon card collection needs in a virtual world and still play the game without having to pay a penny more than what it costs to buy the game itself. And hey, even if you were a fan of collecting the physical cards, the game came with an exclusive promotional Meowth card. So that's pretty sweet. So let's really think about this. How good was this game? And how did it compare to just, you know, playing with the cards? So the game starts up with all these energy symbols floating around everywhere and all these pictures of the booster packs flash up on screen just to make it that bit more clear that this is the trading card game. One thing to point out is that when you start a new game, it brings up this name selection screen. But the funny thing is, is if you just press end without typing anything, it gives you the default name of Mark. As far as I know, this isn't common knowledge, and it's quite an unusual way to do it. So the game starts off, and Mark hears this rumour about the legendary Pokemon cards. And those cards are held by the Grand Masters. <coughs> and they are looking for someone who's worthy enough to inherit those cards. And of course, Mark being Mark, he wants to be the very best like no one ever was. He starts his journey by seeing Dr. Mason <coughs> to see if he can help teach him what he needs to know about Pokemon cards. So Dr. Mason gives you a practice deck to work with and he sends you over to the technician Sam. First of all, you're able to ask him some basic questions about the game. And then once you've asked all the questions that you want to ask, you'll start up a practice game. And during this practice game, you have to follow Dr. Mason's instructions step by step. You literally have to do everything he says. Now if you are a beginner, this is great. However, I sense a couple of problems with this. First of all, this tutorial is completely unskippable. If you already know how to play the game, then I guess you've just got to put up with it. But one thing that really confuses me, why do you ask questions before the practice game? Surely it'd make more sense to have the practice game be told what to do and then be able to ask questions after that. Wouldn't that make more sense? I suppose this would be a good time for me to kind of explain the rules of how the card game actually works. I'm not going to explain every detail because that would take too long. I'm just going to give a brief synopsis. Each player has a team of up to six Pokemon, with one Pokemon being the active Pokemon and the other... 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 being on the bench. You can add Pokemon to the bench and you can move your Pokemon around, but it's each other's active Pokemon that are really fighting each other, as suggested by the term active. If you knock out one of your opponent's Pokemon, they must remove that card and you get to pick up one of your prizes. And this keeps going until one of the players has picked up all of their prizes. And if you pick up all of your prizes, you win. You can also win by knocking out your opponent's Pokemon whilst they've got no other Pokemon on the bench, and you can also win if it gets to your opponent's turn and they have no cards left in their deck. But that's not as common. There are three main different types of card. There are the Pokemon cards, which you can either place on your bench or evolve other Pokemon. There are energy cards, which you attach to your Pokemon in order for them to be able to use their attacks. You can only attach one energy card per turn. There are different energy cards of different types, and different Pokemon and different attacks require different types of energy cards, and different amounts of them. And then there are trainer cards, cards that you can use during your turn, and each trainer card has a different effect. There's no real limit as to how many trainer cards you can use in a turn, 
But once you use a trainer card, you have to add it to the discard pile, which is basically like your pile of cards that have been used up. Also, some Pokemon have Pokemon powers where they've got an extra added effect to them or an extra ability that you can use during your turn. But you can only use a Pokemon's abilities, that is, an ability that requires energy cards, you can only do them at the end of your turn and only once per turn. Those are the basic rules of the game. Of course, there's a lot more to it than just that. If you want to know all the details, then you really should look it up. Although I will say that the rules have changed so much since this Game Boy game was released, and it's best to remember that this Game Boy game is based off the original rule set. After this practice game, Dr. Mason will then offer you a deck based on the three Pokemon that you can choose at the start of Pokemon Red and Blue. Whichever deck you do choose at the start, it's a bit jumbled and a bit messy and not all that great, but what fun would it be to start with a great deck? This is also a game about collecting the cards as well, don't forget. And what I really like about these three options that you've got, unlike the normal Pokemon games, you are not ultimately limited by what you choose at the beginning. For example, you can choose the Charmander and Friends deck, and then still eventually get the cards that are in the other two decks. So this decision at the beginning shouldn't be taken too seriously. And now you're off on your journey. On your way you'll stop off at all the different clubs, gyms, duel all the different club masters, gym leaders. If you beat these club masters they'll award you with a medal, badge. And every so often you'll run into your rival Ronald, blue. Hmm, I have quite a sore throat today it seems. Wait, what's that? You think this sounds a lot like the other Pokemon games where you travel from gym to gym beating the gym leaders to get the badges to fight the Elite Four right every so often face against your rival? Well, I have no idea where you got that idea from, but I guess you're right. And hey, I'm not going to complain about this. I mean, think about it. This is a world where Pokemon cards are popular, so it makes sense if they want to run their competitions based off the Pokemon games. And if you ask me, I think it's rather cute. I'm not sure cute is the right word to use here, but it's the best word that I can think of. The game from this point on is rather non-linear, and there's no real order that you have to do the clubs in. You can pretty much decide for yourself. Of course, jumping straight ahead into dueling the club masters straight away isn't a good idea, considering that you start with such a weak deck. The sensible option is to duel against the regular players first. If you win these matches, you'll be rewarded with a couple of booster packs. Booster packs give you additional cards selected at random that are put into your inventory. And of course, the more cards you have in your inventory, the more customizable your deck is. The regular players are very useful for growing your card collection. Not only are they easier to beat, but they also only play with four prizes, as opposed to six, making the duel shorter. Since each of the clubs focus very heavily on one specific Pokemon type, you usually want to form a deck that can expose their specific weakness, as well as just, you know, being a good deck in general. Of course, the more cards you have, the easier it is to make these decks. Speaking of the club masters, yes, each club is themed off a particular type, but this includes types that don't have their own type in the card game. For example, in the card game, rock Pokemon are classified as fighting, and ghosts are classified as psychic. Yet, there is a club for fighting Pokemon, and there's a club for rock Pokemon. Now granted, they do have different weaknesses and resistances, but I just find that strange. Similarly, there's a club for grass Pokemon, and a club for poison Pokemon, which in this game are both classified as grass types. Now you probably would want to create multiple decks at once, so that you can just select the deck you want to use rather than having to keep re-editing the same deck. The game does let you do this, but I have an issue with how the game handles it. The rules are, a deck must contain 60 cards total, with no more than 4 of the same card, with the exception of basic energy cards, which has no specific limit. That's just how the game works. But if you make a deck, the cards within that deck cannot be used in another deck. For example, Say you want to create two separate decks, each containing four Switch cards. But, if you only have five Switch cards total, the game won't allow you to put four in each. To do that, you'd need a minimum of eight. This basically forces you to edit them in and out of the deck, depending on which deck you want to use. Now, I understand that in reality, with the real cards, that if you owned five Switch cards, and you really wanted to make two decks, each containing four, you couldn't do that. You would have to manually edit them. 
But this is a video game, so what's the point in trying to emulate reality when the game itself can do better than that? The game should not make it awkward to use the decks that you both want to and are able to. This really isn't a huge issue, it doesn't affect the game so much, but it's a slight annoyance that doesn't have to be there and it could have easily been fixed. There are also some machines in Dr. Mason's lab that have deck presets programmed into them. You need the medals to use most of them, but they can form a deck for you given that you have the cards that are needed. There's also a machine where you can add your own presets. That's kinda nice. One thing to point out is that this game uses cards from the first three sets. Base, Jungle and Fossil. There are a few Game Boy exclusive cards that have abilities which would be hard to replicate in real life, such as damaging a random Pokemon. It's quite strange, but not as strange as this. What the hell is this? Okay, so there's this guy that you'll find around called Imakuni. His name is spelled with a question mark for some reason. So you can duel against Imakuni and he has his own battle theme which is strange enough you'd think, but he has the card of himself. There is a trainer card called Imakuni and the description of the card is weird enough he goes around asking children if he's cuter than Pikachu, which I don't even want to think about. But what the card actually does is it confuses your own active Pokemon. Confusing your own Pokemon is never a good thing and I have no idea why anyone would want to use this card. Unless, of course, there's some sort of elaborate, specific strategy that would require you to confuse your own Pokémon. And not only does he actually have this card, but he uses it as every opportunity he gets. Which just leaves me to believe that he is either an idiot, or so self-obsessed that he just has to use his own card regardless of what it does. Now you might be asking, do you get a prize for beating this guy? And yeah, you do eventually. You get the Imakuni card. If you really want to call that a prize, I suppose you do. Really though, the card is nothing but a novelty. And after doing some research online, I found out that in Japan, there's quite a few Imakuni cards. All of them are basically joke cards, and they don't really make any sense. Like, for example, there's a card which tells you to move damage counters around whilst your opponent isn't looking. And if they say that you've done it, then you can just deny it. Of course, if you've used that card, then that would work as evidence against you. But in essence, I guess these cards are just joke cards and novelties, and they wouldn't actually be legal to use in, say, tournaments or anything. There are a few multiplayer features in this game, one of them being multiplayer duel, which I have to say is a really good idea. A great thing about dueling a friend is that you have no idea what deck they're using, and it's really fun to do. There's also a gifting system where you can send cards to other people. Now the normal Pokemon games always had a trading system, and that would be simple. You'd give one of your Pokemon for one of theirs. In this game, however, it's very different. You don't trade, you gift. And the big problem with this is that the game doesn't enforce any agreement. At least on the main Pokemon games, you have to agree before the game will do the trade. In theory, you could have two people agreeing to trade, but it's very possible for them to just get up and leave without giving the other player their card. So you basically have to really trust your friend. But since some cards are so common, you'll have more of them than what's worth having. I suppose you could just give those away, but then who would want them? I suppose you'd want them if you really like collecting the cards rather than just being able to use them. Next thing to mention is Card Pop. Card Pop is a very strange feature and is one of the very few times it includes the Game Boy Colors Infrared. Basically, you choose to Card Pop with someone. Align the Game Boys and each of you will get a random card. It's a nice little bonus, but it's very limited. First of all, you need to know people with the game and the Game Boy Color, since the regular Game Boys won't have the infrared. And once you've card popped with someone, you can't card pop with them again. So the opportunities to use card pop are very slim. And in addition to all that, there are some cards that you can only get via card pop. So it's incredibly hard to get those specific cards. I suppose I should really get to the conclusion. And I must say that all in all, I seriously enjoy this game. Every complaint I have is actually very small in comparison to how fun the game is overall. Actually playing the game, there's actually quite a lot of depth to it. It's not so clear what the perfect deck would be. And you really have to put a lot of thought into it. There is a wide variety of cards and certain combinations work really well together. And it requires some level of creativity. The dueling is also very fun. A lot of thought can go into how you play the game. And even when you're losing really badly, a bit of strategy can go a long way. It's also very addicting to watch your card collection grow. Getting cards opens up new options to you as you play through the game. That's one thing I always really liked about this game. The way you, quote, level up. 
It's not like other RPGs where you'd level up and get higher stats, but you gain a wider variety of options. I would really like to see more RPGs take this approach. And on top of all that, I really like how there's no strict linearity for the clubs, meaning you're not forced to specialise a particular way just because of how far you are through the game. I also want to make a note about the music and the graphics. The music is really good, everything seems to fit so well. I specifically want to talk about the regular battle theme and the Clubmaster battle theme. The regular battle theme is a very catchy tune. It sounds like a battle theme, but it's also playful in that way that you'd expect, considering that it's a trading card game and you're not fighting to save the world. And there's just enough variation, which is good, because these battles can take a lot longer than that of a standard RPG. Clubmaster battle theme is good in the same way, though it has less of a playful style and more of a serious sound to it, you should expect that. The graphics, technically, are pretty good for a Game Boy Color game, but the jewels are where the graphics really shine. Not so much in detail, but rather, everything is made so clear. You have to remember that this is a trading card game being played on a Game Boy Color screen. It's so easy to navigate and find all the information you need, and everything is so clearly represented. The health bars, for instance. HP is between 30 and 120 for all Pokemon, measured in just multiples of 10. So using the circle icons, makes a lot of sense. This also represents how the damage counters are used in the physical card game. The game displays all the information where it's important. Also, it's kind of neat how the main screen emulates how it is on the main Pokemon games. This game is overall great and very overlooked. I think that's because usually the Pokemon games other than the main series were looked as, in general, as mediocre. Think about Pokemon Pinball. I would have really liked a sequel to this game. One with more cards from the later sets. Well, as it turns out, there was a sequel, though it was only released in Japan. I guess it just wasn't so popular in the West. And now there's the Pokemon trading card game online, which is great. It's online, it's more up to date, but you don't earn the cards, you have to buy them. And I understand from a financial perspective that makes perfect sense, and it's also the same way as when you play the real physical card game. I've just always been uneasy with microtransactions. Well, I guess not always since I did used to collect the cards as a kid, but I've always preferred games where I can earn my stuff, rather than buying it with real money. But there's a market there and people will spend the money on the cards, and the money adds up. I kind of feel like the Game Boy game fixed a problem that the online version has caused again. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the online version is bad, not at all. It's probably better in a lot of ways. But it's just that sense of unease I get from the thought of microtransactions. I wouldn't say I'm completely reluctant to it, but there's definitely a lingering sense of unease. That is one of the reasons I still think that the Game Boy game is worth playing today. And I most certainly recommend it.